My name is Mary Alice Morgan, and I am the director of the Women and Gender Studies program, as well as the senior vice provost for service learning here at Mercer. Normally, conferences begin with a lot of housekeeping. I do not want to do that. I think the, the mood and the tone for our gathering here today has been set by our worship service. For those of you um, who may not have received an email that details things like what we're having for lunch and where the bathrooms are, um, there are handouts out in Willingham foyer that you can pick up, as well as maps. I also am not going to go through a lot of thanks this morning. If you read your conference program, you will see on the back uh, a pretty complete enumeration. If I have forgotten anyone, I apologize. I do want to tell you that at lunch, we will have some tables designated um, so that you all can network with one another. That is our goal here today, not only to become educated, but to make connections with one another so that we will be more powerful in the fight against trafficking. So there are lunch tables for law enforcement, uh, for service providers, for faith groups, for student outreach. So if you want to, please gather at those tables, talk to one another, share email addresses. There is in the conference program a little section that says my networking notes. So we've provided that for you. There is one person I would like to thank this morning while I have the podium. And that is my co-chair, Dr. Andrew Silver. Conferences usually begin at least a year ahead of time. This conference was begun in September, six months ago. It is only through Andy Silver's superb research skills, fearlessness in calling up strangers and making allies out of them, and doing outreach Take a look at the back of the program for just a second. There are about 40 agencies, churches, and organizations that are listed here to whom Andrew Silver gave presentations. And there would have been more, except some people told us no. There can be more in the future. One of the things that you will find on your commitment sheet as an option to check off, invite Dr. Morgan and Dr. Silver to come do outreach at your church, your civic group, et cetera. Um, but I want to thank him for having tirelessly worked and for sacrificing time with his family, with his wife, Anya, with his son, Noah, his son, my godson, so that this conference could happen. So please join me in thanking Dr. Silver. Dr. Silver, will you stand up, please? <laughs> Dr. McMahon, at a worship service we had on Wednesday, said a phrase that I think is very um, telling and moving. He talked about the, the tears that we may want to shed um, over the situation of sex trafficking, and he called it a holy grief. Um, out in the foyer, we have actually provided little individual packages of Kleenex. If you feel the need to cry, I hope you will go out and get a package of Kleenex. As Nikki Hardiman said, take care of yourself today. The material that we're going to talk about is, it's hard. 
But I do want to let you know that this conference is going to move from that holy grief toward hope and toward action. That is what your commitment sheet is about. And that is what the networking is about. If you have to leave before the end of today at the ending benediction, when we will be um, students from STOP will be going around and collecting commitment sheets at that time. If you have to leave before then, there is a, a box out in the foyer where you can drop off your commitment sheet throughout the day, so please do that. And our plan is, one year from today, exactly, we will send out an email to everyone who has registered for this conference and has told us what they've done. 12 months from now. We will send out that message and you will know of our accomplishments as a group, as a movement. Because networkers, excuse me, traffickers have a strong network, right? So we have to have a stronger network. The goal of this conference is to make the route that we know exists from Miami to Atlanta, with Macon becoming an increasingly large stop along the way, and to Savannah as well. We want to make sure that this territory is hostile territory to traffickers. So let's export our righteous indignation at the exploitation of children and women from countries like Thailand, Moldova, and Cambodia, and Georgia. Let's answer the call to stop 21st century slavery. Thank you for spending a day with us to stop sex trafficking. the assistant district attorney in Atlanta, who's going to introduce our first guest. Up. Oh. Ah, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Mary Alice. Uh, so the bags that you've received today um, are part of our outreach effort, actually, because one of the things that we need to do for trafficking victims is to provide rehabilitation and uh, ways that they can sustain themselves. And this bag has been made by uh, trafficking victims uh, and victims of prostitution in India. And so we're putting our money to good use here at the conference. Susan. Good morning. My name is Assistant, well, my name is Susan Coppage. I am an Assistant United States Attorney in Atlanta. This is early for students and early for lawyers, so if you want to keep your student hours, go into the law. Um, it is my honor today to introduce Bradley Miles with the Polaris Project. The speakers you're going to hear today will, will focus on the three-pronged attack that is popular in, in discussing in the legislation and in the community when it comes to trafficking. Those three prongs are prevent, protect, and punish. And you will hear speakers who can address all of those issues today. Prevention of human trafficking by targeting demand. Protecting trafficking victims by providing them services and the tools to start over. And punishing those who trade in the freedom of women, children, and men. Now Bradley Miles, our lead off speaker, is Deputy Director of the Polaris Project. The Polaris Project is a non-governmental organization leading the efforts to protect victims of trafficking. 
The Polaris project was begun in 2002, and Bradley Miles has been there for the last seven years. Polaris is named to remind us of the 19th century underground railroad activist who used the North Star to guide African American slaves to freedom. Slavery, unfortunately, still exists. But as before in our history, you are the freedom fighters here today to learn what can be done to prevent trafficking, protect those victims, and punish those who traffic in their fellow human beings. Bradley Miles' extensive efforts while at Polaris are impressive. He oversees the operation of a health and human services funded 24-hour victim hotline that they can call. He has a leadership role on the DC Human Trafficking Task Force. He is project director of the National Human Trafficking Resource Center and through Polaris provides direct assistance and aid to victims of human trafficking. And once you take up the fight against human trafficking and are active in this area, you'll sooner or later meet and hear Bradley Miles. I have worked with Bradley before, reached out to him when I needed information in one of my prosecutions. He is a font of information and knowledge and we're very lucky to have him here today. He has been called on by law enforcement, both federal and local, by lawmakers, both those in this country and those from overseas delegations. He works in the policy arena, he trains individuals, and he has excellent relations with government decision makers. Now what I didn't know about Brad until this week is that he is also an alum of Stanford University. And as a prosecutor, I like to use exhibits, so I have exhibit one for you today, my Stanford alumni magazine, which I got this week knowing that I had to introduce Bradley on Friday. I'm flipping through here, not knowing he was going to be in here. There's this really great GQ shot of him standing on a wet street in Washington, D.C., and the article is entitled, Where Slavery Hides. I would modify that title a little bit, and I would say, Where Slavery Hides, Bradley, Miles, and Polaris shine a light to expose it and help those victimized by human trafficking. Polaris is a vital focal point for law enforcement, which I'm a part of, social service agencies, healthcare organizations, shelters, um, non-governmental organizations, activists. And in the criminal law context, we talk a lot about conspiracies that we call hub and spoke conspiracies. You can picture an old wagon wheel from the West that has the center hub and the spokes coming out from it. And oftentimes, if you're involved in a conspiracy, you don't know the individuals at every end of every spoke on the wheel, but you know the center. And it is so nice to stand before you today and introduce the center of our agreements and efforts to lock hands and attack on numerous fronts human trafficking to fight this heinous crime. Our hub, our center, Polaris, and its Deputy Director, Bradley Miles. Oh, I don't believe she found that article. Um, well, nice to meet you all. I am so, so glad to be here. And what I would like to start off to say is what you all are doing here in Macon is making a splash all over the country. I can tell you that I've already had conversations with students. People have called the hotline at the national hotline that we staff and people are saying, what's going on down there in Macon where this whole community has gotten so fired up about trafficking and focusing on this issue and I know that what you all are doing is incredibly unique. This space here of a whole university of folks sitting to, to talk about this issue and dedicate themselves to this issue and all the lead up that's been going on for this conference is, is a very rare thing and it's, and it's an amazing thing. So I hope that you all feel that you're part of something unique and that you feel that you're part of this movement that you are joining and uh, you realize that what's going on here is rare and it's wonderful and you kind of get... Uh, fired up by it. So what I'm going to try to do today, um, Andrew and others have asked me to, to try to provide a bit of an overview. Um, and I'm going to shift gears a little bit because um, folks also asked me to go into some of the details of specifically some criminal networks that actually exist in the United States of different types of sex trafficking that we've seen play out across different cities and, and, and towns all across the country. So I'm going to go into a few overview slides, but then I'm going to try to drill down as, as much as possible into the specific operations of some trafficking networks. 
Now, the challenge in doing that is, um, as, as you heard this morning, trafficking is a tough subject, and it's, and it's a dark subject. So I want to be as gentle as I can with my language, but at the same time, there's certain pieces of information that I think is really important for people to hear and for people to know. So I'm going to try to strike that balance between giving you the information that we think it's important to share, but also trying to be very gentle and careful with it as we describe what's going on in some of these sex trafficking networks. Um, a couple other caveats before I dive in. One, a lot of the information here we've heard from, from in DC and from what we're hearing on the hotline from other countries and, and other parts of the country, um, but maybe things are a teeny little bit different in how they operate here in Macon or in, in Atlanta. So take some of the things that I'm talking about as generalities, but recognize that there might be some nuance. Um, also, I'm going to try to cover a lot of information in a short period of time, so whatever I don't get to cover, please, please, please come up to me and chat throughout the day. I'd love to talk to as many of you as possible. Um, if you'd like to get this PowerPoint, I'm sure the conference organizers can give you a copy of the PowerPoint. There's probably going to be a lot of text on all the slides, so don't try to read all of it, but maybe get uh, the PowerPoint from the conference organizers. And uh, definitely approach me throughout the day. Um, so let's dive in. Really interesting book here, written by a pimp named Iceberg Slim. Um, it's a book called Pimp. And if any of you are interested in reading uh, an interesting book, um, in addition to Patricia McCormick's book, I would recommend reading this book. Um, it's a pretty sexually explicit book because it was written about a pimp and his time as a pimp for about 30 years. But what we're starting to see is that a lot of the sex traffickers that exist around the country are using this book as their Bible. They are taking their cues and their lessons from a lot of things that are shared in this book. There's one part of the book where one pimp says to another pimp, you know, the woman that, that you've got under your control, it seems like she's not getting out and making enough money on the street every night and turning over all the money to you. And the pimp turns to another pimp and says, you know, how can I get her to, to be more under my control? And the second pimp says, well, what you need to do is you need to get one of those wire coat hangers that give out at the dry cleaner, unwind that wire coat hanger, bend it in two, and that's going to be called a pimp stick, and you whip her back with that, and I promise you she'll get out and get as much money as you can. Guess what we start to see in Washington, D.C.? Pimps using those wire coat hangers to control the women by whipping them on the backs with that, just like back in the old time uh, uh, days of the transatlantic slave trade. And these are cues being taken from this book. He talks about how he wants to con them that Lincoln never freed the slaves. So that's a little bit of what we're talking about here. To dive in, um, wanted to start just very briefly with some definitions, but I think Donna and others are going to go into this a little bit more. This is the definition that we're, that we're working from. This is the definition in the TVPA of 2000. And it's called Severe Forms of Trafficking in Persons. It gives you two, two paragraphs here. The top paragraph talks about sex trafficking. The bottom paragraph talks about labor trafficking. And if you read it, it's kind of weird. It says sex trafficking is sex trafficking. And it, it's kind of like, I don't, I don't know if you've ever seen, like you read a, a definition in the dictionary and you try to say, you know, what is an elephant? And it says, well, an elephant is an elephant. And that doesn't help, you know. So it, you kind of wonder, why is it referencing sex trafficking in the definition of sex trafficking? And what actually it does and is it references another part of the law that defines sex trafficking in this section called Section 103A that says sex trafficking is the recruitment, harboring, transportation, providing, or obtaining of a person for a commercial sex act. There you go. Then it says... Severe forms of sex trafficking, take this whole little sentence here and plop it in to where it is inside these brackets, the full definition of severe forms of sex trafficking is the recruitment, harboring, transportation, providing, or obtaining of a person for a commercial sex act, pause, in which that commercial sex act was induced by force, fraud, or coercion, or in which there was a minor involved. So what we're talking about here is you have a definition of sex trafficking, and then you have this definition of severe forms of sex trafficking. And for purposes of, of much of this conversation, I think it's important to realize these distinctions that exist, 
And, and I know that Donna's going to speak about some of this later, but I think it's important to realize how the structure of the law plays itself out. And what we're going to be talking about in terms of federal prosecutions is you can go for the severe forms of sex trafficking prosecution, and there's some laws on the books to do that, but you could also go for other types of federal prosecutions and state prosecutions. So um, that's a little bit of the structure. So what we're really looking for here, when we're looking for what are, what are we calling severe forms of trafficking, it kind of breaks down into these categories, where it breaks down into these minors who are involved in commercial sex acts, where the law says you don't have to prove force, fraud, or coercion, and then it talks about those 18 or over involved in commercial sex acts with the force, fraud, or coercion, and then there's the whole piece about labor trafficking, which is anyone involved in some sort of labor setting with force, fraud, or coercion can be an adult or a minor. So the name of the game of what the, the, the folks that are focusing on federal trafficking are working on is some combination of these, of, of looking into this concept of sex trafficking, looking into this concept of severe forms of sex trafficking, and generally, colloquially, kind of understanding it as, as these three categories. A um, couple myths. I don't know if you could see that this well, so hopefully you'll be able to get the PowerPoint, but... One of the things that we've seen in the movement for the past seven years is there are these recurring, recurring challenges that a number of us are constantly reminding others about. One of the challenges that we constantly talk about is this myth that trafficked persons are only foreign born and they're only immigrants who've been brought here to this country. So not only is it a challenge to talk about the difference between trafficking happening in other places like India and Thailand and Nepal, and then we have folks that make the reminder let's make sure to talk about trafficking happening here in the United States. But there could be another cognitive hurdle to jump into because where you actually think of trafficking in the United States, you begin to think of only immigrants in the United States who are, quote, trafficked here. And they are from other countries, they speak other languages, they are far from home, they are undocumented. And so we've made it through the hoop of understanding that trafficking isn't just over there. We've gotten far enough to say it's here, and now we're saying it's here, but it's only immigrants. There's one more step that we need to take, which is it's here, and it's not only immigrants, it's also here, and it's United States citizens. Both are protected under the law. Nowhere in this definition of trafficking does it say, there's another line written here that says you have to only be foreign, or you have to be a US citizen. It remains agnostic about that concept. So we're trying to apply this concept as consistently as we can. We have this strike zone, and we're calling everything a strike that meets that strike zone. Whether or not the person is a man or a woman, whether or not the person is an adult or a child, whether or not the person is undocumented or documented, whether or not the person is educated or hasn't gone through some sort of formal education, whether or not the person is a US citizen, or whether or not the person is an immigrant. And so what I would challenge you all to think about is yes, we have this issue of massage parlors that we're gonna be talking about and, and, and Asian women in the massage parlors, but what are some of the types of US citizen trafficking that exist right in this area as well? US citizen pimps recruiting women, US citizen pimps recruiting children, and those are as protected under the Trafficking Act as the foreign-born immigrant folks. So it's a conversation about both. Um, so that's one of the myths, is, is constantly people think, you know, well, this is a crime that you have to be brought here across borders. You have to come across the, the, the border, you have to be undocumented, and they don't realize that that's not the essence of trafficking. The word trafficking was not meant to connote movement or transportation or migration. The word trafficking was meant to connote trade, buying and selling, exploitation. And so we fall into this trap, which is the second myth of talking about trafficking as a form of transportation. They were trafficked from here to there. And what I would encourage you to think of is transportation is not the element of the crime. The essence of the crime is the controlling and the exploitation of another person. So all of these folks that are getting fired up about fighting trafficking, what Polaris Project is doing, this whole group of people that are fighting human trafficking, all of us don't get fired up about the concept of fighting against the movement of people here or there. That's not what gets us up in the morning. What gets us up in the morning is the exploitation of those people, and movement can be an element or might not even be an element. So that's really the essence of what we're focusing on. Um, so we have this concept, you know, we're going to be talking about some forms of sex trafficking, also labor trafficking, and you have this internal trafficking of U.S. citizens that are experiencing both sex trafficking and labor trafficking, and you have this, 
this also foreign nationals, transnational element of trafficking where it's coming into the US for both sex trafficking and labor trafficking. And the point here is don't forget about all four boxes. So in this, con in this conference, we're going to be talking about sex trafficking of US citizens and foreign nationals, but there are these two whole other boxes of different forms of labor trafficking that um, is a whole other conversation to be had. And then the point that I was just making is, don't forget about this whole US citizen box. And let's not get caught in, let's not get boxed in in our thinking of these boxes where we're only thinking of foreign born for sex trafficking and labor trafficking and not realizing that we're, we're trying to do all four. Um, so I kind of covered this point of, uh, it really can happen to anyone. For any history buffs that are out there, this is where the, the law exists in the federal law. There's this chapter 77 called Peonage and Slavery, and I think Susan's probably one of the best folks here to talk to about this. Um, but there's all these laws here, 1581, 1582, 1587. These are laws that were passed a long time ago fighting the transatlantic slave trade. And when they passed the TVPA of 2000 and they were saying, well, we're gonna create these new federal laws that focus on the issue of trafficking, where are we gonna put them in the law? They decided to call back this old chapter in the law that has all these things like vessels for slave trade and enticement into slavery, and they created this new crime, 1589. So these first eight crimes were created 100 years ago or so. These last six crimes were created in the year 2000. So two different merging of history in the same law. So there is that linkage to the, to the former movement. Um, so we're gonna be talking a lot about this federal crime, 1591. But there's other ways to skin a cat, and there's other ways to, to, to really crack down on traffickers, like using the Mann Act, which is transportation for illegal sexual activity and related crimes. It's another federal crime, 2421, 2422, 2423. There's this Immigration and Nationality Statutes, 1324 and 1328, about importing an alien and forcing them into some sort of, um, harboring them in some sort of illegal way and using them for prostitution and sexual exploitation. So when you're cracking down on a trafficker, if you want to use the federal statutes, you're going to hear federal assistant U.S. attorneys talking about some combination of these, these trafficking laws as well as these Mann Act laws and these other types of laws. And that's not even getting into all the state laws that can be used, which I think Don is going to talk about. Hopefully you all know this hotline number. This is the national human trafficking hotline for the United States. Most social service issues launch a national hotline. There's a national domestic violence hotline. You learn about Chris Brown and Rihanna, lots of discussion about domestic violence these days, and people have been saying, don't forget about the national domestic violence hotline. And you hear the domestic violence hotline talking about their calls are spiking up all over the country because so many people are talking about domestic violence as a result of Chris Brown and Rihanna. So, there is other hotlines. There's a National Missing Children's Hotline. There's a National Suicide Prevention Hotline. This is the National Human Trafficking Hotline for the country. It's funded by the Department of Health and Human Services, and uh, it's operated by Polaris Project. And what we do is we try to be this national resource center for anyone who calls for any question, for any purpose. People call and ask, what's a good book to read? What's a good movie to watch? What's going on with this statistic? What's going on with the law? How are things going with this T visa? And what is the T visa? People ask for trainings. People ask for presentations. But sometimes people call because they've found trafficking in their daily lives and they want to report a tip. And they say, you know, there's something going on in my neighborhood. There's something going on in my apartment complex. There's a massage parlor that we know about that's advertised on I-75 on a billboard. And they want to report that into the trafficking hotline. So about 20% of our calls on the national hotline are very, very substantive tips that are describing elements of trafficking to us, which then we work with law enforcement to refer that information on to law enforcement so that they have a constant source of new leads. There's a lot of times when community members might be scared to call law enforcement. They might think they get in trouble for reporting a case, so they might you know, not want to put their, themselves on the radar of law enforcement. So this hotline is operated by a nonprofit. It's operated by me and Polaris and a team of other folks, and so Folks can be comfortable to call. We are not the government, we're not immigration, we can't do anything to anybody, but what we can do is we can take information and share that information with law enforcement when it's appropriate. 
Last year in 2008, we got about 6,000 calls on the national hotline throughout the year. And if you tally up all the different times we learned about potential victims on the hotline, we learned about 2,000 potential victims of trafficking that were told to us on the hotline. It's a big number. And that's even without publicizing the hotline at all by our organization. So if this hotline number gets out there more, more people are calling, the community members are the eyes and ears finding trafficking in their daily lives. This hotline is discovering trafficking and then routing out to other local hotlines and state hotlines and local task forces and things like that. There is a recipe here for linking the nation and creating the networking that you talked about, Mary Alice, is we can link all the state and local hotlines together. We can link the national hotline with the efforts of law enforcement. We can link the efforts of the community members to find trafficking with an outlet that they can refer what they're seeing to, and we can create that network. And as that network gets built, more and more and more victims are being referred to services like they give at Tapestry. More and more victims are being referred to law enforcement for law enforcement to, to, to focus on a case and to crack down on the traffickers and the Johns. And so this really is a recipe. I really believe in it. And I don't mean to, to, to harp on it, but I think that there's a lot of potential if the field can begin to unite and connect the dots in these ways. And this is one of the elements of that big picture. Types of trafficking to look for in your area. This is a, a, a summary of different types of trafficking that domestic servitude, nannies held in homes, these commercial front brothels like massage parlors, Residential brothels based in homes, which we're going to talk about a little bit, um, different than the commercial front brothels in that they don't try to act like a legitimate business. They just operate as an informal economy out of a home. Hostess clubs with heavy sexuality and these inflated prices like Korean room salons, Latino cantina bars, Eastern European dancing clubs, these different things. Escort agencies, online sources like Craigslist in the erotic services section. Where are the pimps in your community? Where are the migrant farm workers, the sweatshops, these peddling and begging rings? Even people selling magazines door to door who have this sales total that they have to meet so they could win a trip home to Cancun or whatever else. There's lots and lots of things going on with the magazine crews that I think are an undiscovered world. Um, and even restaurants and low wage industries, nail salons. So they, they, there's lots and lots and lots of fertile ground to really look into of all these different places. To jump into some of these types of sex trafficking, I want to start with sex trafficking networks that victimize Latina women and girls. This is a prevalent network throughout the United States. Mostly Latin American traffickers, mostly victimizing Latin American women and girls. The network morphs into three different heads, almost, three different categories. The first part are these residential brothels. When the residential brothels feel too much heat from law enforcement, they turn mobile and they turn into these escort services that they call delivery services. And they also have these cantina bars, which are basically this place where it's this uh, kind of bar where the women are there to sell drinks and sell beers and things like that. But the purpose of the bar is to make money off the women's sexuality, jack up the prices of the beers, and then force the women to sell the beers. So it's kind of a, a labor trafficking situation where they're forced to be hostesses blended with a sex trafficking situation if they're forced to have sex outside of being the hostesses. So you have this population of Latino women and girls, and you have this population of traffickers, and the traffickers are routing the women and girls into these different groups. And the groups are all linked. So the same population of women and girls one week may be in the Latino brothels, then they be, may be in one of the delivery services, and then they may be bounced over to the cantina bars. Now on the hotline, we have this really, really unique perspective because we're getting calls from all over the country. In a given day, we get about 30 or 40 calls, and so we could see patterns. And I can't tell you how many calls we get from around the country about these three networks. One of the unique things about these networks is that they're restricted only for Latino Johns, which means that you have to be a Latino man to go in. So you have to speak Spanish, you have to pass a certain number of tests, you have to know where they are, you have to know certain code words. The networks usually advertise with these little fake business cards called tarjetas that they give out to most of the Latin American men in the community. And the sex acts in these locations are enormously consistent. $30 for 15 minutes. So you have a given brothel in one of these homes and uh, you have a few mattresses and you have this stream of Johns coming in and the Johns are paying $30. 
They walk into the front door, they pay their $30, they get some sort of payment token back that they've paid, like a poker chip or a glass bead or a playing card or whatever else. Then they sit there awkwardly on this group of couches with the 10 other Johns looking at each other, wondering that they're all about to have sex with the same woman. And then they take their turn with one of the women, they give her the poker chip that indicates that they've paid, they have 15 minutes with her, and then they're out. So the woman is usually having sex with anywhere from 10 men on a slow day, 20 men, 30 men, 40 men, 50 men on a, on a busy day, where the shift for the woman is going from 10 a.m. till about 10 p.m. or so. So it's a 12-hour shift of four men a day. Um, and it's, I've been into a number of these locations after a law enforcement raid, and I promise you, they are one of the toughest locations that I've ever walked into um, to see what the women are going through and to see the, the location there. Here's a picture that I took in one of the Latino residential brothels. They had built this kind of wooden structure in this garage where they took a garage and built this wooden plywood to divide the garage up into four different rooms. And they had a woman kept in each room with this kind of mattress that they probably got off Craigslist for free, um, a little thing of wet wipes, a little thing of paper towels, a thing of rubbing alcohol, a little trash can filled with used condoms, and a little cup of urine where the woman uh, used the restroom. So um, brutal, brutal network. Um, and I think that we're seeing these networks all over the country from the hotline calls that we're getting, which tells me maybe they're here. Maybe they're somewhere in Atlanta. Maybe they're somewhere in Georgia. Maybe they're throughout the South. We know that there's raids in North Carolina. There have been raids on these in, in, in Northern Virginia. So this is a network to be aware of. Same network operates, except when the residential brothels feels too much heat, they just take the women and drive the women mobily to wherever the Johns are. And then this whole cantina bar system is, a, is, a, is a kind of a different animal. Um, because they have opened a business. They are selling alcohol and beer and, and food and then trying to operate with a business with a brothel on the side. And so these three things are, are, are maybe not always um, in every community, but we're seeing them in so many communities that it's something that needs to be part of the discussion and it's something that needs to really be looked for and, and, and aware of and the women who come out of these networks who've been in one of these residential brothels, we're serving about seven or eight of them right now. And they, um, they have a, a lot of trauma that they have faced um, and that they have requested a whole host of services from us, from legal services to mental health services to referrals to doctors to um, a couple of the women recently couldn't read or write and so they wanted to go to school in some capacity, ESL classes. And so when the women come out of the Latino brothels, there's that challenge. Um, so here, here's kind of this image of these Latino brothels, um, and we'll see if they exist in the area. Hopefully there are some speakers here who could potentially talk to this. Um, so moving on. Let's say here's a woman. Latino brothels are known to also victimize children. And so you have children in the Latino brothels and women. So here's one woman or child. Let's say she has 25 men in a day. Each man is paying $30 per day. For seven days in that brothel, that's about $5,000 that the brothel's making. And if you say one brothel with two women is making around $10,000 per week, operates for 52 weeks a year, that's about $588,000 of cash going through that Latino brothel. So the Latino brothels, guess what? Gangs are very interested in the brothel because they're saying, wow, there's so much cash on site. How could we get a piece of that cash? So now you have gangs that are raiding the brothels. So the brothels become a magnet for gang activity. So you have MS-13 and you have other gangs that are cracking down on the brothels. And then the brothels say, wow, we need some protection from these gangs. So they start paying off a gang to protect the brothel from another gang. So now you have all these different gang members involved with the brothel, all these different Johns going through the brothel, these pimps operating the brothel, transporters driving the women because the women switch gears about every week and they switch to another brothel weekly. And then you have gangs involved. So it's this really, really complex thing going on of gangs, transporters, pimps, and johns all colluding together to victimize this group of women. Now, 
Don is going to give a, a talk later about Johns, but what I think it's important to realize is it's very, very easy in a trafficking conference to focus a lot of our time on the women and what they're going through, and then focus a lot of our time on the traffickers and how they're greedy and what they're doing. And the silent partner in all of this becomes this kind of massive amorphous category of Johns, hence the word John, like John Doe, Jane Doe, don't even have a name. These are the guys that actually, we talk about them the least, but they may be the engine that's driving all of it because they're the monetary incentive for the pimps to open the brothel in the first place. And if the women are there to be motivated by some hope for money to send back home, the Johns are providing that money. So the conversation about Johns is now becoming to the forefront of the conversation about trafficking in the United States because Johns are the silent partner. And if our communities are doing something about Johns, things begin to trickle down to the traffickers and the women. But if our communities are only doing things about traffickers and the women, and the Johns remain the silent partner, there will be two revolving doors of more traffickers and more women because the Johns have been remained untouched. So there's this massive population of Johns that are going to these places and the places are opening up. Hence, they're making lots of money, $588,000 a year. Let's switch gears and talk a little bit about US citizen pimps, or so-called pimps, more appropriately referred to as sex traffickers. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I know it's going to be covered in the rest of the conference, but these are the US citizen version of sex traffickers. They are using force. They are using coercion. They are using beatings to keep the women in line. You usually have pimps that are putting nightly quotas over the women's heads about how much they have to make, whether or not the woman's in a strip club under the pimp's control, she's in street prostitution under the pimp's control, she's in some sort of residential brothel under the pimp's control. You even have pimps sending their women into these Latino brothels, and so the Latino brothels are collaborating with the U.S. citizen pimps. You have the pimps sending women on Craigslist, and the women have this quota over their head. They have to turn over 100% of their money to the pimp, and the pimp is using much more violence, much more control to keep the women in this state of obedience and fear and terror and loyalty and love to this pimp, which is this very, 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 very difficult blend. Um, and the pimps are doing anything that they can to keep the women under their control. So the nightly quotas, um, driving the women around the country when they need to, placing the women in all these different venues of commercial sex, controlling the women through phone calls and keeping an eye on them, constant monitoring, um, all these different things, making money motivated by the Johns. So wherever you have Johns paying for sex, you have pimps trying to pimp women to get at that money. So again, there's that inextricable linkage. And then you have society that's glorifying the behavior of pimps. There's fraternity parties, talking about pimp and hoe parties. There's the Oscar song, it's hard out here for a pimp. There's every single line of products you could imagine, like this baby wearing this thing called playground pimp. So the word pimp has, uh, has, has become so prevalent in our world that pimps have been able to traffic other women because the community's not outraged by what they're doing because the community actually thinks what they're doing is cool. So how can the pimps be caught when the community is glorifying what they're doing? And on top of that, how can women understand and children understand the vulnerabilities of being recruited by a pimp if they've been so inculcated with the belief that when the pimp comes talk to them, it's actually a cool thing that's happening to them. They're going to get to hang out with a pimp. And so the glorification of pimps has made it easier for pimps to operate, and pimps are laughing and celebrating, and they're saying, this is hilarious. We're sitting here victimizing women and girls. We're engaging in pretty much every federal crime on the book, ranging from the Mann Act to trafficking to sexual abuse to tax fraud to everything else. We're engaging in every federal crime on the book, and somehow the American community has glorified us and allowed us to do it. So... Pimps are a very, very prevalent form of trafficking all around the country, victimizing US citizen women and girls. And of all of these networks that we're talking about, pimps are the most likely to recruit children. They are focusing on targeting children. They are average age of entry into prostitution in the United States, 12 to 14 years old. Um, so this is a very, very dangerous network. And many of those pimps are reading that book by Iceberg Slim to learn how to pimp. 
And if they can't get a copy of that book, they're going on Amazon.com and renting the book, The 48 Laws of Pimping, or The 48 Laws of Power, or Pimpology, or all these different pimp, pimp books that are sold on Amazon.com that teach you how to control a woman or a child and to take all of her money. Um, here's a pimp, a woman or girl, maybe she has a $500 a night quota. She's forced out seven days a week, so she's making $3,000. $500 for the pimp each week. Maybe the pimp is controlling three women or girls at, his, at a time called a stable, which the pimp refers to. So the pimp is making about $10,000 a week. Let's say the pimp strives for the perfect attendance award, which means he forced women and children into prostitution 365 days a year. He had perfect attendance. He's making about $500,000 per year by controlling three women and taking all of their money. 80 pimps operating in the metro DC area, $47 million of, of income. So um, you have, uh, you have a, a real challenge here um, with society glorifying pimps, people maybe not thinking that pimping is a really dangerous thing. It might be kind of a, a victimless crime or you know the woman chose the pimp. We used to go out around the community and ask people, what do you think of a pimp? And most people would say, well, it's a manager, it's a daddy, he looks out for the women, he keeps them in line, all these different things. And so th there's kind of this, this, this notion that pimps are not this very dangerous force in our community, but they are. And they are a form of sex trafficking that exists. Let's end with uh, Asian brothels. How am I doing on time? 10 minutes, great. So. Remember when we talked about the Latino brothels, we broke it into those three categories, the residential brothels, the escort services, and the, the cantina bars. In the Asian sex industry, here's those three categories again. Here's the residential brothels, here's the escort services, and here's these hostess clubs like the cantina bars, which are called room salons. Um, and it's really interesting. Just like in the Latino community, these, these last three were restricted for Latino Johns. In the Asian community, these last three are restricted for Asian Johns. So in the Asian sex industry, there are Asian men who are able to access residential brothels and homes, escort services, and these room salons, but those three networks are only available to Asian men. There is one network, however, that is incredibly unique to the Asian sex trafficking industry that's different from the Latino sex trafficking industry and different from the pimp controlled networks in that Asians have ventured into the world of commercial front massage. They've added a fourth gig. And this is the world that is, is, is incredibly fascinating because these are legitimate businesses. They register with the county government or the city government. They have a business license. They pay taxes. They have credit card machines. They're swiping John's credit cards. They can be subject to inspection. They are paying rent to a landlord. They advertise in the yellow pages. They advertise in the city papers. They advertise on billboards. They are entrenched in the community because they're trying to be this kind of wolf in sheep's clothing where they come across as this innocent little massage parlor where people giggle about happy endings when really they're a fully operating brothel just with this kind of cloak around it. So you have these massage parlors that exist. And here's a, here's a sample Washington Post ad. This is the sports page, sports page of the Washington Post. You have here one, two, three, four, five, six times six lines, little seventh one up here. That's about 25 ads per day in the Washington Post. This is back in 2003. Each of these ads costs about $800 a day. So to advertise for these 25 massage parlors that all existed in DC, someone calculate 800 times 25 a day, and that's a lot of money. Um, so you have the, this whole network in Washington, DC, um, which we've been working on, and there's now down to about seven in Washington, DC. But this same network, all of these ads, exists in every major city around the country. They exist in Chicago, they exist in San Francisco, they exist in LA, they exist in New York, in Atlanta, here. And so what we're seeing is this whole network is a very well-coordinated national network. It is not independent 
folks that aren't in touch with each other. It is a massive, well-coordinated network. And this is the manifestation of how it operates. So um, let's walk through some of it. First, you have targeted recruiters back in Asia that are recruiting some of the women. When the women can't pay off the debt that it costs to, to come to America, they're linking in with these third-party money lenders. So some of the women in these networks have debts to these third-party money lenders, and they're afraid of this loan shark. Then they have this smuggling fee as an immediate source of debt and a vulnerability to exploitation, because the woman starts off in the hole. She has this smuggling fee over her head. Sometimes they come in through large international airports as regional hubs. This would be Atlanta Airport, San Francisco, LA, and New York, and JFK. Sometimes they're coming in with legitimate visas, like tourist visas, employment visas, student visas, and then they overstay the visa. Sometimes they're coming in with false visas, where you just match the photo on the visa to another Asian woman that looks like them, and they try to come through with a legitimate visa. Sometimes they're coming in called entered without inspection. They're coming in and just jumping the borders in Mexico and Canada. Um, now you have false promises. Certainly the women aren't told what the whole world is going to be when they get here. Um, they're not told that they're only going to be paid by tips and that some men don't pay tips. They think they're coming to maybe make a minimum wage. They don't realize that they have to have sex for an hour with a man in the hope that he gives them a tip. And only in the case of when he gives them a tip is when they make money to start paying off their debt. So it's a pretty, pretty tough situation when you're only paid by tips. The only way you get tips is to have commercial sex, and the only way you make off your debt is to make the tips. So where in that world do you not get to have commercial sex? You don't. That's the, that's the boa constrictor of the network. They create this world that says, here's your debt. You can't make any money unless you make a tip. And you can't make a tip unless you do whatever the guy is pleasurable to the guy. And is the guy going to give a tip with just a back massage for 10 minutes? Probably not. And so the women realize pretty quickly that to start paying off that debt, they better do something to please the men. And the only thing that the men are coming there for when you say, do they see this woman? They, of course, don't see this woman. They're seeing an object. You read the boards of men who go to these places, and they're interchangeably talking about women and inanimate sex dolls in the same conversation. So they're not thinking of these people as people. They're thinking of them as objects. So then you have these taxi drivers that are driving amongst the network and that are transporting the women from brothel to brothel. The women live at the brothel for the entire period of time that they're there for about two or three weeks. And the only way they move is through these transporters that come and pick them up and drive them to another brothel. So you don't really see the women having independent transportation. They're driven around by this network of transporters. To be in one of those taxi cabs is a price of about $100 per hour. So if you're being driven from here to Miami, however long that drive is, Eight, you know, eight hours, that's going to be an $800 ride added to your tip. So here's how the, the money works. The women have all these different fees. They have their smuggling fee. They have a house fee, which they just have to pay room and board each week. Then they have a manager fee just to pay the mama -san, a kitchen lady fee to, to pay this kitchen lady who does the towels and the sheets, a house rules violation fee, a security fee, um, Tips to the taxi drivers to go out on errands for them because they're not allowed to leave the parlor. Tips to the manager to give them better customers because the manager knows when the customer is kind of going to be a good customer or a bad customer. Um, the taxi driver rate, sometimes if they get arrested, a fee to get bailed out of jail. And then they have this big debt and they're getting charged 10% interest on this debt. So they have about 14 different fees that they have to pay. And, um, Somehow, the only way they could pay off these fees is through these tips from men in commercial sex. So it works like a boa constrictor. Um, the women are motivated to, to pay off this debt. They're motivated to send money home. And so they're caught in this really, really vicious cycle. Um, I really wish I, could, I had more time to go through a lot of this. But this is why I'm hoping that uh, you all will get a copy of this PowerPoint. And you'll also come chat with me um, throughout the day. But there's, there's lots to talk about at these massage parlors. I kind of really went overboard with the massage parlor slides. Um, but what I want to end with is uh, a very brief story that'll take about a minute. About a week ago, um, we were called into a massage parlor in Washington, DC. And uh, the police had just raided the massage parlor. And they weren't going to arrest the women. And they wanted to call Polaris in to offer services to the women. 
And so we jumped in the car and went driving there. It was a, it was a massage parlor in downtown DC. There's more massage parlors there than there are Starbucks. And um, we, we go into the massage parlor and, and our team of social workers are working with the women. And I'm just kind of stuck there um, sitting in the lobby, kind of heckling the Johns who are coming in and out. And so um, I'm, click, I'm, I'm f kind of drifting through the massage parlor and all of a sudden I come across this. This was a photo, I don't know if you could see it very well, that was pasted to the doorway near where the woman slept. The mama-san had pasted this photo right near their bed. And it's this picture of this guy who's coming home from work and this woman wearing an apron who's cutting fruit with this guy. This is white family here. And the top of the photo says, today's the day to believe in fairy tales. And this mama-san had put up this photo to give the women this hope that if they stayed in this brothel long enough, someday maybe they would get to the point of having this life. And I was so shocked um, that I took the photo and wanted to include it for you all. But this is a real network. It's, it's a network that's victimizing these women. Um, and it's part of this overall network of all these different sex trafficking networks in the United States. And so on any given day, we're seeing this broiling Latino commercial sex industry with its three parts. We're seeing the Asian commercial sex industry with all of its parts. We're seeing pimps victimizing women and children. All these different things that I haven't even covered, like Brazil, the whole Brazilian sex industry and the whole Eastern European sex industry, and that just exists in the United States, victimizing women and children that all meet that original definition that I showed you of the severe forms of trafficking and trafficking. And somehow the crafty mama-san had come up with this concept of today's the day to believe in fairy tales. So what you all are doing here is incredibly important. Um, I was really glad to come down and, and speak with you all. Please come out to me throughout the day, and thanks for your attention. Take care.